Welcome everybody. Welcome to this first Movella Sports Conference. The Sports Conference is about combining sports and kinematics. And today our aim is to give you valuable insight into different tools that can be used and combined for performing analysis in research and in sporting environments. This also includes a detailed look at the latest innovations for measuring human motion in sports, such as EMG, force plates, but also software applications that can calculate kinematics. During this sports conference, our speakers will share their insights about the technology and the application in motion capture. We hope that by showing in the uh, innovative combination of analysis tools for researchers and sports scientists, that they will learn new ways to investigate an athlete's performance capabilities. The session will be hosted by Eric Wilmers. He is a PhD researcher at the Free University of Amsterdam. And also he does his project at the, the Royal Dutch Soccer Association. And his presentation will be about inertial sensors in football, research, and practice. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Jordi. Um, yeah, Jordi uh, was a master's student. He graduated at, um, in my project, so I know him quite well. So thanks for the invitation for this, uh, this webinar. Um, yeah, so I'll, sh I'll show some of the projects that we do here at the Soccer Association. Um, I work at the VU University in Amsterdam, but actually all of my research is, is at the Soccer Association, so I mostly work there. Um, and I have a background in mechanical engineering, but also in human movement sciences. Uh, and I'm trying to combine the best of both worlds, basically, in my project. Um, yeah, and I'll, in my research, uh, we're using a lot of inertial sensors. Um, so basically everything has to do with football or, so or soccer. Um, and we use the inertial sensors because we can actually uh, measure kinematics and movements on the field. Um, so I'll start with a quick intro, or not too quick, uh, about inertial sensors for the ones who don't know. Um, inertia, inertial measurement units um, are small sensors, uh, a couple of grams, um, and they contain a 3D accelerometer, a 3D gyroscope, and a 3D uh, magnetometer. And you can combine those measurements to estimate the 3D orientation of the sensor in space. And therefore, if you fix the sensor to a human body, you can actually estimate the, uh, the orientation of that segment that it's attached to. Um, and you can obtain the kinematics of a, of, of a player or, or a person. Now, um, how, do, how does that work, the orientation estimation? Let's say we have a sensor, and here I'm giving a 2D example. Uh, we have the, um, the the earth frame, so the coordinate frame that is fixed uh, to the earth and to space. Um, and we have the sensor, and the sensor has a frame. Um, and in this case, they have uh, an X and a Y direction only because we have a 2D uh, example. Now let's say that we want to estimate the orientation of the sensor. What we can do, um, is measure the acceleration. And we can calculate the angle of the acceleration vector, which for simplicity we normalize to one. And we can measure the angle compared uh, to the gravity because with uh, orientation estimation with inertial sensors, you assume the gravity um, that, that the acceleration that you measure is the gravity. So we can we measure this one in y direction, zero in the x direction, and we can calculate the angle uh, with the inverse tangent. Now, for example, if we rotate this sensor by 45 degrees, um, we get this. So we still have the same uh, gravity vector, which is still one, but we also measure uh, the angular velocity. So there are two ways now that we can get to this orientation. So one is by calculating uh, the angle again. So uh, the angle between these axes and the, um, the Earth axis. And that would look like this. 
So then we have the 45 degree angle. But we can also just go simply by integrating the, uh, the angular velocity. That's when we also get to 45 degrees. Now, um, the, as you can imagine, the linear acceleration, and especially in sports, um, is almost never the gravity only. So only limited thrust can be put into the orientation estimation of the accelerometer. Um, and that's why we combine the gyroscope measurements and the accelerometer for the magnetometer. It's a bit the same. Uh, we combine it in a filter. Don't look at the details too much, uh, but basically these are the measurements coming in. You combine them by putting more or less thrust in the accelerometer or magnetometer or the gyroscope and you get to an estimated orientation here on the right side. Now, if we um, want to estimate segment orientation or the orientation of body segments, um, we can do this by um, attaching the sensors to the body segments. And then we have to know how the sensors are attached to the body segments. So that's why you need some sort of a calibration procedure. Um, and one that we use is here on the right, um, which is kind of a functional calibration. Uh, it's quite easy to do and quite fast. Um, and then you can combine it with a, a biomechanical model and you can get the kinematics out of it. So this is of a, of a short print in one of the, one of the um, studies that we did. So we can basically get the, for example, here the hip flexion angles, so we can get it out of it. Now, when we use these sensors in sports, there are a couple of errors that we'll basically always make. It's unavoidable that we make this. Maybe we can, um, we, we can decrease the errors a bit here and there, um, but we are making errors. That's definitely the case. And these errors can be um, divided into three main errors. So there's one, the error is how you define the body frames. So how you define the coordinate frame of a body segment. Um, then the second one is orientation filter errors. So uh, that the orientation filter does not actually give you the right estimate of how the sensor is oriented in space. And we have, which is could be quite a big part, uh, is soft tissue artifacts. Now, the body frame definition error, uh, when we are using a marker-based system, um, and that has a lot of downsides, but also some, uh, some pluses, um, we define a body frame based on markers positioned at bony landmarks. So, for example, here you have the, pels, the pelvis, uh, you place the, uh, the, the, the markers, you place them on these bony parts, and basically you know where those bony parts are in space, and based on that you can define uh, the x, y, and z axis. But with inertial sensors, we actually don't have a notion of where um, the body parts are in space. So we have to define the body frames in a different way. So that's why we use either postures or movements um, to be able to get the body frame. And in our case, we use just an upright posture where we assume that the, um, the longitudinal axis is in alignment with the gravitational uh, direction. And we use a bow forward uh, to be able to get the uh, axis that's pointing lateral, laterally. So that's how we define uh, a body frame. Then we also make orientation filter errors, and there could be different causes for these uh, orientation filter errors, but I'll start with the example um, that I used previously. So here again, we have the, uh, the sensor, we have the uh, coordinate frame that's fixed to the earth on the left bottom. And we again, we measure uh, the gravity, which uh, we again normalize to one, and then when the sensor is standing still, we can calculate the angle uh, between uh, both frames and we get to zero, which is correct in this case. Now, if we add a linear acceleration to this, 
you can see that the um, resulting vector um, is not pointing in a y direction but the orientation of the sensor is still the same it is still upright but if we add a linear acceleration we get a different uh, vector, acceleration factor that we measure with the accelerometer so now if we try to calculate the angle uh, we use the and we use the accelerometer we actually get to an orientation of 45 degrees or an angle of 45 degrees but everyone can see that's not correct so it should be what zero degrees then also the gyroscope uh, with the gyroscope we make an error because when we uh, have when we measure the angular velocity we always measure error as well that could be just random error but also um, systematic errors for example if your sensor heats up a bit that could lead to a, to a, to a bias in the uh, angular velocity measures that you have so now if we calculate the the angle from the um, angular angular velocity I'm sorry um, we do not only get the integral of the actual uh, angular velocity but also the integral of the uh, error in the angular velocity so if we go from this orientation to this orientation we measure the actual angular velocity we integrate it it's 45 degrees but we also measure the error and that gets added to it so it's 45 degree plus or minus the error it depends on whether uh, the error is negative or positive so we also don't get an accurate estimate um, so the orientation filter error has causes in the presence of linear accelerations um, you also have magnetic distortions especially when you're inside uh, of buildings where there are electrical wires uh, you get magnetic fields everywhere so you have these magnetic distortions and, and it basically works the same as I just so showed because you don't have the um, the, the, mag the magnetic uh, the, the earth has a magnetic field that has a vector when there is magnetic distortions you don't only measure the magnetic field factor of the earth but also the distortion so it works the same as uh, as the previous example with the accelerometer and you get integration errors uh, you may not have calibrated a sensor correctly uh, so that it has systematic biases in the uh, accelerometer or gyroscope or magnetometer which also leads to errors um, and what you can have is a slight misalignments of the axis in the sensor itself i won't go too deep into into that one um, but basically the magnetometer and the uh, the accelerometer and uh, gyroscope are different sensors and those uh, axes are not always uh, perfectly aligned now the other error that we make is a soft tissue artifact error and this is a picture of one of the studies that i'll um, go through and so the soft tissue artifact is the relative motion uh, between the sensors or markers if you lose if you use a marker system um, in the bone and basically what we want is to measure the orientation of the bones but usually we cannot measure it directly because there's muscles and uh, fat skin there there is something in between the bones and the sensors or the markers that you have so the difference is called between the bone and the where the sensors or markers are is the soft tissue artifact um, now we did a study where we measured the errors um, that we make with the inertial sensors so we put inertial sensors into a rigid marker cluster so that the rigid marker cluster had the same coordinate frame um, as the sensor so then if we measure the orientation of the rigid marker cluster um, but we also have the orientation of the sensor the difference between those two is the error of the orientation filter then the other thing we have is the definition of the body frame i explained before um, 
but basically with the uh, markers you use the bony landmarks um, to define the coordinate frames of your body segments but with the IMUs you have to use either postures or movements to define um, to define a body frame um, and then the last one is the soft tissue artifact error and the soft tissue artifact error that we measured is actually more an estimation of the soft tissue artifact error because we um, estimated the difference in or we we, we measured the dis difference in orientation between the rigid marker cluster and the orientation defined from the bony landmarks um, the orientation defined from the bony landmarks also suffers from um, soft tissue artifacts but we assumed that this was much less um, than when these sensors are placed on uh, on, on the middle of body segments. So we used 10 amateur football players. They were equipped with inertia measurement units um, in uh, the rigid marker clusters, as you can see in the picture. And we used the markers on bony landmarks. And we let them perform nine movements, basically three different types of movements, each performed uh, at a different intensity. So we did a squat, a squat jump, uh, a squat a squat jump at 50% and 100%, a walk, a run at 50% and a maximal sprint, and a short pass, a long pass or a cross and a maximal kick. And then we compared the uh, IMUs versus the optoelectronic system, which is often seen as the golden standard. And we defined the errors by expressing the uh, minimum angle of rotation between um, different coordinate frames. So for example here we have the a squat jump at 100% that we measured and then I'll go through the errors that we make with this. So this is for the five segments that we measured is the definition of the body frame and in black uh, you have the total error which is the minimum angle uh, minimum angle of rotation between the body frames um, and then in uh, yellow, red, and blue, we have the different directions. And as you can see, throughout a movement, the uh, definition of the body frame, the error of it, um, is constant. And that's just because it's a definition error. The, nothing changes with the definition uh, when you move. But as you can see, these errors can be quite large. Then we have the orientation filter errors. Um, and as you can see, there there is a kind of a slower or a lower frequent part of the orientation filter error in the beginning. That's during the squat part of the, of the jump. Then there is higher frequency error um, at push off. There is and there is higher frequency error again at um, at the at coming down. Um, and basically, we kind of see the same with the soft tissue artifact error. So, but especially the soft tissue artifact error, they can have quite large, um, low frequent errors. And that is mostly caused by skin sliding or muscle contractions. For example, with the sensor of the pelvis, um, if you bend forward, there is a lot of skin sliding over the bone. So you don't actually measure the bone, but the orientation of the sensor actually changes quite a bit with respect um, to, the, to the markers of the, on the bony landmark. So that's what you, especially with the pelvis, what you can see here in the beginning part. And then again, you have a little bit of a higher frequency error um, around push-off and a bit of a higher frequency error around, um, around uh, landing. And that is mostly because of inertia effect. The, mass, the, the, the sensor itself has mass, um, and especially in our study, because we attached the sensors to the rigid mark clusters, it actually had even more mass, so you um, exaggerate these effects. You also have inertia effect of the muscles. So especially when you land, and especially with your thigh, basically your whole thigh is uh, or your thigh bone is covered by muscle. So there is nowhere where you can actually attach the sensor um, kind of to the bone. So when you land, the 
uh, muscles they just they, they blubber around the around the leg so that's that's an, an error that you make and now if we combine these errors um, yeah you can see kind of low frequent errors and high frequent errors and if we look across all the movements that we measured um, we see that actually the largest error is due to the definition of the body frames and then the orientation filter error and the soft tissue artifact error are actually quite similar and and they don't add up linearly um, and that is because not all the errors are always in the same direction for example one error can go um, to one one way and the other error can go to the other way so they can basically cancel each other out now since we know, this is kind of a project we we uh, did lately and and this is one of the earlier projects that we did um, and this is so the previous project was more of a fundamental um, project um, and this is when we apply it in the field so um, we did one study to hamstring injuries and um, on how kin kinematics uh, changed with fatigue. Um, so for the ones who don't know, uh, here we are looking at the back of a right leg and the, um, the, uh, the hamstrings, they attach to the pelvis and you have the lateral hamstring, which is the biceps femoris, which attaches to the uh, head of the fibula and the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus, um, which I would call the medial hamstrings, um, they attach to the medial part of the of the shin bone or the tibia. Um, and basically, the main functions of these muscles are uh, hip extension and knee flexion. And injury to these muscles is quite common in football, but also uh, field hockey, for example. Um, and what we see in soccer actually is that um, the rate of injuries, uh, of hamstring injuries specifically, um, they increase throughout each half. So after the rest, it recovers uh, and then it rises up again. So what that says is that um, hamstring injuries are related to fatigue. Um, it should be. So, but we, what we also know is that a lot of the hamstring injuries, they occur during sprinting. In soccer, about almost 60% of the hamstring strain injuries are sustained during sprinting. So, um, especially maximal sprints are quite a common uh, method of, of sustaining a, uh, a hamstring injury. And what we also know is that the hamstrings are most susceptible during the late swing phase. So when the leg is swinging forward during a stride cycle, um, that's when the hamstring length is the, is the longest, um, but also where you see the highest muscle activity um, and also where you would see the highest muscle forces. And what we also know is that excessive strain of muscle fibers can cause damage to these muscle fibers. And what we also know is that a reduced capacity um, is, that, is that you have a reduced capacity to uh, decelerate the lower limb during fatigue. And in turn, that could lead to ex excessive strain of muscle fibers, uh, which causes muscle damage and thus injuries. So what, we, what did we do? We did a 19 minute uh, football match simulation. And before and after each 15 minutes, we measured uh, hamstring strength and um, the explosiveness of the hamstrings which I will not go into today um, and we measured sprint performance and sprint kinematics and uh, we did this on the field so we measured the sprint kinematics uh, with inertial sensors and that looks like this so it has has quite some change of directions and also different running speeds um, it's it's walking, it's sprinting, it's jogging, and basically everything is in the football match simulation. Uh, just we, we got rid of the ball, basically. And then we um, designed a um, rigid dynamometer 
uh, which we could put um, participants in really quickly. So within one minute of the field, we could test the participants. And we designed this specifically to, to be very quick um, because we wanted to minimize the recovery after um, after the part of the field um, to the to the hamstring uh, strength test. So we could actually see um, what the, what the fatigue was of the hamstrings. We also measured EMG, which I won't go into uh, either. Um, so this is this is the four signal. So we basically saw the uh, we looked at or the torque. So we looked at what the maximal torque was and how it declined over time with fatigue. And then this this one you saw before as well, um, which is the sprint kinematics. And then what we found is that um, a decrease in maximal hamstring strength or force that they could produce was related to a increase in um, or, or a, actually a decrease in knee angle uh, at peak knee extension. So which means that the knee extended further during the sprints um, that were performed in fatigued state than in fresh state. And we also found kind of the same thing uh, when we combined the uh, hip flexion angle with the knee uh, with the knee angle, which is kind of a surrogate measure for the hamstring length. So what we found is that the um, the higher the, the this combined angle is, um, the 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 greater the hamstring length is. So what we found is that a decrease in maximal voluntary torque, so the maximal hamstring strength that they could produce at that uh, moment in time, was related to the the surrogate measure of, of hamstring length. So basically, if you fatigue, you reach higher peak hamstring length. Um, and this higher peak hamstring length could lead to a higher risk of, uh, of hamstring injuries. So what you see in this, in this graph is every color is, a, uh, is, is one participant. Um, and what you see is that for some participants, this, this relationship would be stronger than for other, other participants. So that might be a reason why some people uh, tend to have a higher risk for hamstring strain injuries than others. So the conclusion from, from these studies uh, were that hamstring fatigue is related to a greater knee extension during the late swing phase in sprinting. The ha that hamstring fatigue leads to greater peak ham hamstring length in sprinting, but that the strength of this relation uh, differs quite a bit per person and that may be related to injury susceptibility. And then I'll, I'll look a bit on, yeah, I'll do this one as well. Then we'll have a look at the next project, which is, um, this is basically my main project where we are trying to look at physical load um, on the field. And we try to measure this um, with inertial sensors, and I will go more into this in detail later. But why would we want to um, estimate the physical load um, of football players. Well, when you design a training program, you actually want to be able to check if they actually performed um, how you wanted your players to perform. So basically, if you design it, you want to check if um, the players did what you wanted them to do. So you can, when you measure the physical load, you can uh, check the intended physical load of your training that you designed with your training program. What it also allows you to do is to prevent under or overload, which could lead either to uh, decreases in performance um, or increases in injury rates. So injury prevention um, and performance optimization. Now, if we look at physical load, we can kind of look at the physical load from two perspectives. So we can look at physical load from a physiological perspective. Uh, which would be more the cardiovascular load, so a heart rate, for example, uh, or a metabolic load, so how much energy you, you would use. And we could look at uh, physical load from a biomechanical perspective. So that's more um, about the forces that you, that you endure or the accelerations that you endure. And for example, if you would compare our body to a car, um, the physiological load would be the amount of fuel you use with the with the um, combustion engine, 
and the biomechanical load would be more the forces on the springs, dampers, uh, the gearbox, um, and that would be related more to the uh, forces or um, accelerations on uh, muscles or um, basic, basically the structural elements of your body. Um, the thing is, um, why it's important to distinguish between these two types is because they have different adaptation rates. Uh, people tend to just recover more quickly from a physiological training stimulus than from a biomechanical stimulus. For example, if you have a lot of eccentric muscle contractions, you get really small, small damages in your muscle fibers, and it tends to take longer for those to recover than to recover from a physiological um, training impulse. And so that basically looks like this. So um, the black line uh, or the, the black bars on top, they um, show the training stimulus and the black lines in the bottom, they show the adaptation. So basically you're, uh, you start at zero, um, but if you, put, if you do your training stimulus, uh, your biomechanical st training stimulus too soon, over time, the structures um, deteriorate in quality until you end up um, with an injury. So your stamina might improve, but your, uh, the structures in your body may, um, may decrease in, in quality over time. So if we can make this distinguish, we can try to adapt our training a bit, where, for example, in the first training, we still have the same. But in the second training, we have the same uh, physiological training stimulus, but we try to decrease the biomechanical stimulus a bit so that it doesn't put such a strain on the athletes. So that's how you can keep up with having a good quality of, your, of, your, of the structures of, in your body, um, but still increase your stamina. Now, how um, physical load is often measured in football, it's usually done with time motion analysis. So basically people or, or athletes wear, um, wear a sensor on their back, which measures the uh, location on the field. And the, the variables that uh, we distract out of this are things such as cover distance, uh, running velocity or the distance that uh, a player covers above certain uh, velocity thresholds. But if we look at this, uh, at this part again, so at which perspective, where uh, do we actually measure? Do we measure physiological or biomechanical? We actually measure mostly physiological, but the physiological load, um, especially in football players, it doesn't really lead to injury. I, I think almost none of you ha has ever heard of an overtrained football uh, so so an, a football player with overtraining syndrome it just doesn't happen because they get injured before they can even get it so the biomechanical load is where we actually would want to measure if we want to prevent injuries now one of the measures that um, that is used as a uh, as a biomechanical load measure is the player load which is the rate of acceleration of a player. Um, but that's measured between the scapula, so on the back of a player, at the same part where their location uh, is measured. The problem with this is, however, it is measured on the back and not where actually the, the load on the muscles occurs. So that may lead to an underestimation of the biomechanical loads that we measure with the player load. So that's why we developed the hip load um, we need three inertial sensors to uh, get the hip load of both hips, basically one at the pelvis, one at the, um, at, at the left thigh, and one at the right thigh. And then the hip load is the squared magnitude of the angular acceleration, and we divide it by a scale factor which makes the, the hip load, uh, the number, a bit more readable. Otherwise, we get really, really big numbers. Um, and then we designed a study where we aim to test the, uh, the test retest reliability of hip load, which is really important because if we want to compare multiple training sessions with each other, um, we need to be able to know if we can rely on this measure. So if we do uh, two times the same thing, does it measure two times the same thing? 
that should be a pre that that is quite an important uh, prerequisite. And we uh, aim to test the validity of the hip load. So does it actually measure what we want to measure? Uh, and we uh, looked at the differences between uh, player load. So what we what did we do? Um, we let uh, we we did two identical sessions, so we could compare both sessions uh, with each other. Um, we let the, the the soccer players perform a normalization run, and this normalization run um, was used as a basis basic uh, basis um, physical load. Uh, so we normalized all the physical loads to this normalization run. Then we did six different uh, shuttle runs. Um, and the first seven meters of the shuttle run were paced using auditory beeps. So uh, people started at cone one, a beep sounded, they had to run, be at cone three at the next beep, and then they had a two second runoff before it started again to the other side. So there was a beep at cone four, a beep at cone two, a two second runoff. Then we did this without uh, jumps or shots. We did the same, so the same, um, the same running intensity uh, with a shot, a maximal shot at cone three on the way to the right or at cone two on the way to the left. And we did the same thing with jumps. So a jump at cone three and a jump at cone two. And with the kicks, it looked like this. I think you cannot hear the beeps, but there are beeps which uh, which guide him. And then uh, we looked at the differences. So um, the normalization run was one. Then we had the um, the low running intensity. There were no differences between uh, between player load and the hip loads. Um, then we had the high intensity run, uh, which had where we saw that the hip load uh, was quite a bit more sensitive to the running intensity than the player load. Then we saw with kicks that especially the kicking leg um, was more sensitive to, to kicks. And basically with jumps, the player load and the hip load were, uh, were quite similar. So what we can uh, conclude from this is uh, that for the measurement of football specific movements, uh, hip load is more sensitive to biomechanical loads posed uh, on the player than the hip load. Mm, I didn't show these results, but the test re retest reliability was okay, which allows for comparison uh, between two sessions. And then we need more research to quantify the potential relationship between uh, hip load and injury. And to be able to do that, we need to measure hip load over a prolonged time, see when people um, get injured and then we can relate the amount of hip load to the injury rate. Then I have one last project and this we are actually just starting this project up so we we only measured a couple of participants but uh, I think it's quite interesting um, so I, I did wanted to share a bit of it. So for the ones who don't know um, the ACL or the anterior cruciate ligament uh, is a ligament uh, between the, your, your thigh bone and your shin bone, so between the femur and the tibia. And this, this helps in stabilizing the knee. And in this, the picture on the right, you can see how it's often injured. So you have a medial rotation of the, of the thigh bone with respect to the, uh, with respect to the, the shin bone. And often this goes with the anterior translation of the shin bone with respect to the thigh bone. And then the forces can get too high on the anterior cruciate ligament and it can rupture. And I can say from a personal experience that it's not nice to have your uh, ACL ruptured. Uh, so that's why we want to prevent this um, because it's quite a devastating injuries. injury. Um, it takes between nine and 12 months to return after surgery. Um, and what we know is that, that the hamstrings and the quadriceps, quadriceps muscles, so the hamstrings are on the back of your thigh, the quadriceps are on the uh, front of your thigh, um, they aid in the active stabilization of the knee. And to, to, to put it in a bit simpler words, 
um, they can take the force of the anterior cruciate ligament. Now, we wanted to design a return to play test because, uh, well, basically now let's let's look first at what uh, return to play test we do now. So basically, you have a nine to twelve month um, rehabilitation, um, and at the end, before we want, before we make the decision of uh, players being able to return to the field or to return to train to training, we want to test them. So there are minimum strengths that you should be able to to achieve. So that's what what you test in a in a biodex for the for the ones who know. Then we have hop tests, which uh, measures already a bit more, um, not necessarily strength, but also movement quality. Um, but there is also quite a big of a strength component in it. So, for example, we measure the distance you can hop with one leg, um, one hop, uh, three hops, uh, but also a timed uh, timed hop. So basically, you should cover uh, cover a couple of meters as quick as you can. But actually, none of these tests are specific for football. And they also don't really measure the quality of movement that you would have on the field. So that's why we wanted to design uh, a test where we could actually measure it. So, um, as I said, the, the quadriceps and hamstrings, they are quite important in active stabilization of the knee. Um, and what we also know is that a side cutting movement or a change of direction movement is a really common way to uh, tear your ACL. So we wanted to simulate the, the injury mechanism for a bit and see how uh, the muscle activity was just before landing. So that's what you see in this, in this video. There is a gate uh, with a light. And once, um, once the player runs through this first gate, um, then there uh, there lights up a second gate either on the left or the right side of the uh, of, of of the target. Um, so the player has to make a last minute decision of which direction he wants to go. So and what we do is that we measure the muscle activity of the quadriceps and the hamstrings just before landing on the cross. So there is a force plate beneath the cross um, with, with which we can determine the time of ground contact. And we look at the, um, at the muscle activities just before ground contact. Um, so this is a, quite a common injury mechanism. The, we try to measure the uh, pre-activation of uh, those muscles. So the active stabilization basically of of those muscles uh, before ground contact. And we also look at the landing postures uh, with inertial sensors. Um, and we couple these inertial sensors to a biomechanical model. And, and that's how we get to the, um, to the kinematics. So that's what you see here, basically. And here you see the sidestep. Yeah. And then what we get out of it, we get the ground reaction force, um, the, um, the 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 uh, hip flexion extension angles and knee flexion extension angles uh, at ground contact. And then we look at the muscle activity activities just before landing. Um, here we see the biceps femoris, which is the lateral hamstring, uh, costus lateralis, which is uh, one of the uh, lateral uh, quadriceps muscles. Muscle, I should say. Um, then we have the semi group. I'm calling this the semi group because where we measure um, this activity, the semi tendinosus and semi membranosus are on top of each other. So basically, you would measure probably more semi tendinosus activity because it's on top, but also uh, semi membranosus activity. So that's why I would rather call it the semi group and not the semi tendinosus that you measure. And then one of the things that we look at um, is we subtract the, um, the semi, semi group muscle activity from the fastus lateralis activity, because this semi group can actually take a force of the ACL, but the fastus lateralis has the opposite function. 
so it can actually put more force on the ACL. And um, with this sidestepping movement, um, what other researchers saw in female uh, handball players is when you subtract these, the players who had a really high number here, and I think the cutoff was 30 or 40, um, they were way more susceptible to ACL injuries than, um, than players who did not have that, so who had a lower uh, number here. But now we, we only measured uh, a couple of participants yet, so we, we are measuring at the moment. So these are just some preview examples, um, but I think it's, it's a really interesting, um, inter interesting uh, project. So I did want, want to share. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we, what we do um, here. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. To ask. Also feel free to uh, contact me or uh, you can also find more information about uh, my project but also other projects um, are, which are related to injury prevention on uh, www.ctsaltiasanius.nl. Um, so thanks. Okay, thank you very much Eric for a really nice presentation. Very nice to see all the content again at uh, the Dutch Soccer Association. Um, we have a question from uh, Vignes, and he asks mm -hmm. if you have noticed different kind of soft tissue act artifacts in, um, based on different BMIs of the people you were measuring on. And how did you compensate for this? Yeah, basically we uh, did no compensation uh, because we wanted to measure how large the errors were. Um, so we did no compensation at all. Um, but that's definitely, definitely the case. The more fat you have, uh, the greater the the, uh, the soft tissue artifacts are. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, we have another question from Thomas Global. He asks, basically, uh, if you are measuring biomechanical load in a more applied way, um, do you think the hip load you are calculating or something similar mm -hmm. could also be determined by a tracking system, for example, step balance or uh, as Kinexon does? Um, I'm not familiar with those systems, so I don't actually know uh, what they do. Um, but we, yeah, we measured the the uh, the angular velocity of the hip, so we differentiated to get the angular acceleration of the hip. And ultimately, the angular acceleration of a joint is related either either to uh, ground reaction forces or forces if someone pushes you, um, or muscle forces. So the, the accelerate, angular acceleration of a joint is always related to forces somewhere. Um, but it is definitely a simplification. In the ideal world, we, wa we would want to estimate uh, forces on muscles itself. Uh, but we're, we're quite far away from doing that um, live. We can do it in the lab, but doing it on the field, it's, uh, it's still quite a challenge. So. I hope that answers his question. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, I have a question from Miha Drobodnic. He's uh, basically asking you something regarding the return to play uh, section, where you mm -hmm. discussed the un unanticipated uh, 90 degree change of direction. And yeah. his question is, was the starting leg self-selected or did you instruct them to perform, for example, 10 starts with the left and 10 starts with the right leg? No, it was self-selected and also we as researchers, uh, we don't know when the light goes on to the right or to the, le or to the left. Um, so we, we also could not basically match the, match the amounts of, uh, of side cuts to the left with starting with the right leg front or with the left leg front. So it's, it's random and it's self-selected. Okay, I have another question from Soran. Um, he is asking you basically, um, what do you think about the joint moment and energetics? In in what in, during a during a side cut movement or the? It doesn't say it, but <laughs> um, I think one of the two, or maybe in relation to the whole project, the energetics and the, the joint moment. Yeah. Um, especially. Um, so what 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 is. Um, Known in research is that, um, so I'll just answer it in terms of the ACL injury, um, is that a knee abduction moment is um, 
at a high knee abduction moment is related related to a greater chance of uh, rupturing your ACL, especially in the first part of ground contact. So we think from research, it's not too clear, but we think that uh, the ACL injury happens in the first 10 or 15 percent um, of the total duration of the ground con contact. So really the first part of the ground contact is quite important. Um, and I know some research, but I am a bit careful in uh, reciting it because I don't know by heart, but at certain landing postures are related to a high early peak in um, knee abduction moments. So um, yeah, the, these knee abduction moments, they really, they, they can change depending on how you perform a, a side cutting task. Okay, thank you, Eric. I hope, Saran, this was the, the answer you were looking for. Otherwise, feel free to uh, contact us again. Um, I have another question for you, Eric, from Cherry. And he is asking if the errors are different in the different planes. So for frontal, sagittal transfers, do you see different errors in the different planes? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it also depends on the, on, on the segments. Um, but for example, um, and that could also have a bit to do that we used uh, the rigid marker clusters, which actually had a greater contact area with the um, with the body, and that means that the, um, the 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 errors they don't really occur in the plane uh, that it's attached to, but more uh, yeah the how do you say it? perpendicular to this plane. But that could also have to do with the with the fact that we do use those bigger rigid marker clusters which has a, had a bigger contact area with the skin okay thank you very much um i have another question um and basically what atia is asking you is do you think the performance of the athlete should be more based on emg data or on the imu data um, I wouldn't say more on one or, or the other. It's always a combination. It's always a combination. So um, I wouldn't say more. I think in the end, your how you move relates to the EMG data. So I also wouldn't say that they are that separate. Um, but that is something I want to look at that if... Um, how the people who have this uh, lower pre-activation of the uh, of the semi group um, do they also have a different landing posture, for example? But at the moment, I don't know. Okay, Eric. Uh, these were the questions for now. Um, if people have more questions in a later stage, like Eric also said, please feel free to contact one of us. And um, Eric, we want to really thank you uh, very much for joining as a speaker to this conference, and uh, we wish you very much luck with the. The last stages of the PhD trial and um, thanks.